Well, let's jump into our series for a bit. And we are in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, a series called Supernatural. Supernatural power of God falling in a messed up city with, by the name of Corinth and God doing what only he can do. And so uh, in this particular chapter, uh, I want to point out, we're going to read a key verse, and I want to help you today. I believe in an area that we all struggle with for sure. So let's read the key verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can bear. When you are tempted, he will show you the way of escape that you may be able to endure. I want to talk to you about the way of escape and something that we all deal with in life, and that is temptations, this lure to go a different way than the way of God. And temptations, I don't care if you've been saved for two weeks or 25 years, temptations are here to stay. It's just life on a broken planet. They look different, they sound different, they feel different, but temptations, they're, they're, they're kind of like junk mail and credit card offers. You don't want them, but they're just going to keep showing up, you know, every day of your life. So how do we deal with those temptations? Because you don't have to sit there very long, think very far back, and you can spot a temptation in your life that you yielded to. Because sometimes we yield, sometimes we resist. Sometimes we cry out to God, other times we give up. Even if it's a, a simple temptation, like you know you shouldn't have had that third piece of pie before you went to bed, but it was just crying out your name, you know, eat me. So whether you ate it, smoked it, vape it, drank with it, slept with it, whatever you did, it started out as a temptation, didn't it? And so how do we deal with these temptations as we study this, this letter today for a few minutes? They come in three different areas. They affect our heart, they affect our mind, and our mouth. Those are the three testing grounds, your heart, your mind, and your mouth. The word temptation here in the Greek, perasmas, means an invitation to sin that comes as a test of our faith. It's an enticement to wander from the word and the ways of God. So Jesus was actually tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And we know he resisted. He showed us how to do it. But he overcame the temptation by going to the word of God. Now, the way of escape, that's what we're going to talk about today. There is a path where you can walk away from those things that are trying to drag you down. And it's not an ejector button where you find yourself in a compromising situation that you shouldn't be in. And so, you know, you kind of just pull a lever and those, those rubber slides at the plane flop down and you whoo, slide to safety. It's not that visual. It's not pulling the rip cord and all of a sudden you're parachuted out of the, the mess that you were in. Speaking of that, there was a brief cameo of me jumping out of a perfectly good airplane in that video. Did you guys catch that? So let me just use this illustration to tell you what the way of escape is not. We jumped out of this plane. It was a, it was a tandem jump. We went up to about 12,000 feet. I've got the jump instructor on my back. We're strapped together. And it's, it's a great adrenaline rush. And the moment is when they roll up the door and they say, to the door. And then you're like, ah, and it's great. And so you free fall for about 8,000 feet. And then you pull the chute and you, you glide on down. So the falling part is just, it's a rush. It's so fun. And he said, Dave, you're going to pull the ripcord, big yellow handle. He puts the altimeter in front of my face at 4,000 feet. Gives me the thumbs up. I pull the deal. But, and I've done this a few times. But it didn't, it didn't slow us down like it usually does. And I look up, and the parachute is all caught up in the cables, and a little part of it's open. But we are still plummeting toward the earth at a pretty good rate of speed. And it's amazing how much goes through your mind in moments like that. My first thought was, oh, so this is how it ends. <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> My second thought is, the guys that pack those chutes, they don't pay them enough money. And so I could see my, my jump instructor was very concerned. He goes, okay, Dave, take your leg and throw it over to the, like this, right leg, throw it like this. So together, we do that about three times. We start spinning, the thing untangles, and whoo, the parachute opens, and I'm here with you fine folks. God is good. Now, if it wouldn't have untangled at about 3,500 feet, he would have had to release the, the tangled parachute, pull the secondary chute, and escaped plummeting straight into the earth, but that's not the way of escape. It's not a bailout. It's not a trap door. It is a path that God wants you to walk on, and he has given you the Holy Spirit and his word and keys in scripture where you can live above temptation. 
Because, listen, guys, a lot of us have done this. Yield to temptation again and again, and pretty soon it becomes a pattern. And if you don't get free of that pattern of yielding, it turns into what the Bible calls a stronghold. And now you have a stronghold in your life. And name a stronghold, any stronghold. Could be pornography addiction, alcohol addiction. Could be gossip and slander, overeating, whatever it might be. But now this stronghold captures your life in such a way that you start to believe that you can never get free. Let me just give you some good news today. Whom the Son sets free is free entirely, and there is no bondage too great that the power of Christ and the shed blood of Jesus cannot break every chain and release you, but you got to participate in the process. I'm going to preach at you at the 11 o'clock service. So back to the beginning of the chapter. This is the words of Paul in chapter 10. He says, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. A little bit of uh, explanation on these verses. He's not saying that Moses was out there in the Red Sea dunking and baptizing two million Jews, all right? What he was saying is they were all immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit in the wilderness. They all had this same experience together, and just like water baptism, they came out of Egypt and were no longer identified as slaves, but it was a brand new day, and they were identified as free people. So Paul is taking that analogy and saying, this is who you are, New Testament believers. Now, verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual food, drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, look at this, and that rock was Christ. Say what? Jesus shows up in the wilderness 1,500 years before he shows up in Bethlehem because obviously God the Son, this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, and he manifested himself in the cloud by day, the fire by night, and this water that came out of a rock. Now, some historians and commentarians, they believe that this rock in the wilderness actually followed the children of Israel because they always had water, plenty of water, in the middle of a desert. And if you've been to Masada and Engedi and around the Dead Sea, dude, there is no water to drink in those parts. And so they wandered for 40 years. And so they had the living water. And of course, Jesus is the typology, the rock of our salvation. And the living water is the Holy Spirit. But, But here is the problem. Even with God accompanying them, they still, they caved in. They still allowed the temptation to feed their flesh and to murmur against God to take them out. And instead of taking the way of escape, they walked down a path of destruction. Look at verse 5. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did. Now, this kind of takes a really tough turn here. Like, Jesus is with you, you got the cloud by day, the fire by night. In fact, here's a visual to help you just kind of feel what was going on. This was the camp of two million Israelites, and in the middle of the wilderness, this cloud of fire could be seen. It put terror in the hearts of their enemies. God said, I'm going to guide you, and he would come down in the tent of meeting right there, speak with Moses. There was food falling out of the sky. Manna came from heaven. God caused quail to fly into the middle of the camp, and they had quail for dinner. There's, this is a supernatural moment, and still even with that happening all around them, they fell into temptation and ended up dying in the wilderness. What's the application? Here it is. You can be right in the middle of a Holy Spirit-filled church with worship in the presence of God like you experience today. You can hear the preaching of the word, watch people get baptized in water, but still personally go down the way of temptation and destruction. That's what he's saying. There's a warning here, and so we're gonna learn from the warning that they, uh, that they receive, all right? Now, these three areas, the heart, the mind, and the tongue are, are so huge in our lives, and so he, he points out how the specific failure affected them. Look at verse seven. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. The word revelry has sexual connotation, orgies and the like. He says, we should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. Wow, this is really going wrong. (laughs) Really hard left here. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Maybe a verse for the kids. I don't know. That's up to you. 
But these things happen to them as examples. They're written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. Now, you're thinking, okay, this really escalated quickly from be careful not to set your hearts on wrong things to um, snakes biting us and a destroying angel. Well, when you read a verse like this in the Old Testament, you should immediately thank God that you are in the dispensation of grace. Anybody grateful that you're not under the law, but you're under grace? Okay. But there is an application, and it's this, that what they experience in physical death, we experience in spiritual death. Because once sin is conceived in the heart, then you begin to take action, and the wages or the consequences of sin equals death. That's, that's the warning that he's laying out here. Verse 12. Now, as I read verse 12, uh, just before I read it, understand that one of the problems of the church in Corinth, they had spiritual pride, there was some arrogance going on, and they were all about me, my rights, my stuff, really familiar with, with where we live in 21st century. And, and so Paul was addressing this spiritual pride. It's throughout the letter. And so right here he says, if you think you're standing strong, be careful that you don't fall. And then where we started, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can bear when you are tempted, he will show you what the way of escape that you might be able to endure it. Now, this is one of those verses that gets misquoted a lot. And it gets misquoted back to pastors. I've heard this several times over the years. Some will say, Pastor Dave, God told me that he won't give me more than I could bear. And they're talking about their circumstances, their marriage, their finances, a trial. And they're like, God told me he wouldn't give me more than I could take, and I can't take any more. Well, actually, God didn't make you that promise. God never said that life would be served up with only what you could bear. In fact, a good definition of a life of faith is you're going to be in above your pay grade, and you're going to be facing some things that you can't bear, thus you're going to need dependency, not on your strength, but on the strength of God. There's a supernatural component here, because in your weakness, then you're made strong. But here's the promise that he did make. There will be no temptation, no enticement to sin, that God will not give you the grace to endure it and find a path, a way of escape. And I want you to see this, it's a visual. This whole idea, there's access to temptation and there's egress away from it. And, and it takes intentionality and it takes discipline and it takes us obeying the word of God to walk away from those things would, would try to entrap us. Think about it this way. When you pulled up to the building today, um, I love our guest services and, and don't you just love them? They're out there smiling and you got all the orange cones. Can we give it up for guest services at all locations? Okay, so. You had access in, right? You drove in, and then when you leave today, you're gonna have an egress. You're gonna follow, and they move the cones around while we're worshiping, and you drive out, and you go back home. And by the way, as you leave, could you just be nice to one another in the parking lot? Seriously, some of you Christians, you get all ticked off out there. Let me just get in your business a little bit. I had a lady call me a few weeks ago. She was irate. Someone flipped her off in the parking lot leaving church. And so, yeah, I told Pastor Mark, you can't do that anymore, bro. No, it wasn't, wasn't him as far as you know. <laughs> so you, you access and then you egress. So there is a path that God wants you to walk, to walk out of temptation. And so let me just hit these three areas right here. The first temptation that he covered was, um, he says, I don't want you to be idolaters and turn to idols as some of them were. Now, as, when I talk about idolatry, I don't want you to think Old Testament or you think, well, I'm safe, Right? I don't have any shrines on my mantle. There's no statues of Buddha or Baal or Asherah poles in the house and burning incense to. Praise God, stay with it. But New Testament idolatry is not shrines and incense. It's allowing something or someone other than Jesus to sit upon the throne of your heart. Here's, here's a great definition of New Testament idolatry. Bring this up. When the throne of my heart that is the highest place of my affections and desires is occupied by anyone or anything other than Jesus. That's idolatry. So based on that definition, we all struggle with it. Your idol could be your girlfriend. 
Your idol could be the car that you've been dreaming about getting. It could be your golf game or your savings, your investments, your second home, whatever it might be, whatever captures the highest place. And it's not just glib Christianese to go, well, Jesus is my Lord. He's number one. But over here, I'm actually living a lifestyle that reflects something completely different. Because your, your investments and your conversation will give away who's really on the throne of your heart. You see, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you'll know who's sitting upon the throne because that's always in your conversation. You'll know what really owns your heart because that's where you invest your treasure. That's why it's so easy for true believers to give and to tithe. He owns us. He loves us. He's the Lord of my life. To give him the first tenth of my increase is not a big deal after what he's done for me because I'm walking in a relationship where he is true. I believe in my life he's truly number one. Now, this is not a one and done. It's not like, hey, I prayed back in 97. I said, Jesus, be my Lord. And I got a Jesus is Lord bumper sticker on my car back in the day. You know, one way, thumbs up, whatever you're doing. And, and No, every day of my life, every day of your life, there are moments where you make a decision. Will Jesus be Lord? Will I submit to what he's leading me into? So that's the first area. So the number one way of escape right here, bring it up. The way of escape from idolatry is a surrendered life of true worship, where Jesus is, is my all in all. You know, Lord quoted the Old Testament. He said, here's the number one. Here's the greatest commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. The second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor like that as you would love yourself. And all the prophets and all the law hang on those two commandments. And so when I'm in love with him, when I'm submitting my life to him, something happens. Temptation is breaking off my life. I'm walking down a path, an egress of the grace of God, the lordship of Christ, and temptation begins to fall away. The second area he deals with of, of temptation is sexual immorality, which the Corinthians were, were quite proficient at if you were here for the sexual immorality chapter. Um, but here's the thought I want to give you today. All sexual immorality, or what the Bible calls lust of the flesh, so that would include every kind of appetite and overindulgence, it all begins right here in the mind. The battle's in the mind long before it manifests itself in flirtation or pornography addiction or an affair with somebody, it all starts right here. And you're either going to win or lose the battle of your appetites here before it ever manifests in your body and in your circumstances. So what do we do? Number two, the way of escape from sexual immorality or the desires of the flesh. So it's actually a broader topic than, than just sex. It's a renewed mind. It's a renewed mind. We must have our minds renewed continually because your mind is being bombarded perpetually by news media, by social media, by your friends, by everything going on in the world. You live in a toxic atmosphere, and you know that, of doubt and unbelief and confusion. So we are to have our minds transformed continually. The Bible says that the word of God, there's a washing of water by the word. And when, even right now, as you're hearing the teaching of the word, there's a cleansing going on. The word is washing over your mind. It's changing the way you think, and it's actually cleaning some stuff up. People say, oh, don't go to the Father's house. They're just trying to brainwash you down there. Exactly. <laughs> trying to wash your filthy brain with the word of God. That's what's going on. You need some brainwashing. <laughs> That'll get edited out and quoted. It'll be on a social media post somewhere. <laughs> New cult in Vacaville. You know, ah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's the last service, guys. I'm running on fumes and caffeine, I got to tell you. <laughs> and anointing. I feel pretty good about that. Uh, let's do a little audience participation, shall we? I'm going to read some verses, and I want you to read out with some passion the bold. I'll drink to that. Romans 12, 2. Here we go. You read the bold. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 4.22, all of us. Here we go. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That is your thoughts and your attitudes. Colossians 3.2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Philippians 4.8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble and right and pure and lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what? 
meditate on these things. Psalm 1, blessed is, is the one who, the, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. You'll be like trees planted along the river bank or by rivers of living water and bearing fruit in every season. Your leaves do not wither and you prosper in everything you do. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, read this one out. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Romans 8, 6. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the spirit control your mind, that leads to life and peace. So get this. When I'm meditating, that means slow down. Slow down when you're reading the word. You're just not like, morning devotions, got to get through two psalms and a proverb, uh, late for, got to get by the coffee shop. No, just slow down. To meditate means to mutter over and again and again, to bring it back up, to think it through, to let the word of God just soak your heart and mind. Something happens in the process of meditation that renews and restores your thought patterns. It's Joshua 1.8. God told Joshua, because he's getting ready to fight a bunch of battles, he said, do not let this book of the law, the written word, the Torah, depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night so that you might be careful to do everything that is written within it. Then you will be prosperous and have good success. Now, probably most of us in the room, prosperity and good success, life goals, right? I want to be prosperous and successful. There's a pattern here. He says, if you'll meditate on the word of God, then what's going to happen, it goes from your heart it's gonna get in your mouth because from the abundance of the heart, the mouth is gonna speak. And when you start speaking the word of God over your marriage, over your finances, over your future, over your education, over your ministry, it's in your heart, you're speaking it out. Now your emotions begin to grab a hold of your confession, which leads to action. Now he said, be careful to do everything that you've been med meditating on. So once I speak it, meditate on it, I start living in the action of it, something happens. Now I'm on a path leading away from temptation and I'm walking in the way of prosperity and success. But everybody just repeat this after me. It's a process, it's a, it's a process. See, I, I meet a lot of Christians, they just want to go to a meeting, have Brother Wonderful, the star evangelist, lay hands on them and give them a prophetic word, and suddenly everything's just wonderful and great and changed. And maybe that happens, and if you find that meeting and that guy, tell me, I want to go see him. <laughs> but here's been my experience. It's a process. Meditating in the word, renewing our minds. And the more that you meditate on the word of God, and s listen, set your affections that is the attitude of your heart on things above. You know, I've been doing something here in just the last week or two, and I've been thinking more about heaven because people are coming up to me going, Dave, is this the last days? Is Jesus wrapping this thing up? Like, I don't know, but it could be. And so I'm thinking about it. What is my perspective, and how much time do I spend thinking about eternity with Jesus and what that's going to be like? Well, it will shift the way you think. You begin to realize, wow, life is short. Eternity is real. There, there's a king coming on a white horse with fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand, and he's going to redeem his church. And everything we've read about eternity to come is, in fact, our inheritance, and you're really going to enjoy it. I hope to see you there, right? But setting your affection on things above, it changes your mindset, and it allows you to walk away from temptation. Now, the last one, Paul deals with the problem with our tongues, our confession, and this is an area we all fall into because you don't have to learn the dialect of complaint. You were born with it in your fallen nature. We just complain. We're, we're good at it, right? And we murmur and we speak out against people and slandering somebody is easier than complimenting in our fallen nature. That's just the way we're hardwired. In fact, James said it this way. James 3.8. No one can tame the tongue. That, that is in the flesh. It is restless and evil and full of deadly poison. Ouch. That's why we have to retrain our tongues. Look at what it says. This gives us hope here in chapter 3. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. Amen? <laughs> no amens? Okay. <laughs> that guy. For if we could, could, look at this. If we could control our tongues, we'd be perfect. Now, he's not talking about sinless perfection. That's not what this word is. It's not a bar like, hey, if you could do this, you'd be up here, but you're never going to reach it. The word perfect means fully matured in virtue and integrity. So as you mature in your faith, you can also control yourself in every other way. 
So as I mature in the Lord and I control what I say, I can control my attitude, my anger, my appetites, my relationships, my finances, but it all has to do with the rudder. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And so I'm just going to challenge you guys. Think about it this week. Ask yourself this question. Am I speaking life over my spouse? Am I speaking life over my coworkers? Am I speaking life over the future and everything that God has put in front of me? Am I speaking life or death? Because the confession of your mouth is setting a track that you will run on. You see, the children of Israel, 14 different times in the record of Scripture, they struck out and spoke out against the Lord. They murmured and they complained until their confession became a track that they ran on and they died in the wilderness. Look at this in Exodus 16 too. The whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. Okay, so they went after the pastors. Welcome to my world. <laughs> here's what we do. Most of us are not gonna shake our fist at God. Some people do, but here's what we do. We start to blame shift. I want to blame that leader, that small group leader, that pastor, that church, hurt by the church hoodie, wearing it now. You know, it's their fault that I'm out here in this wilderness. So that's, that's exactly what they did. And then they started speaking nonsense. Look at this. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat, and we ate all the bread we wanted. But now you brought us into the wilderness to starve us all to death. Wow. Now, how do you know that's not true? God brought them out to lead them in. But here's what happened. When you start focusing on your temporary circumstances, when your eyes are on, I can't pay my bills this week, or I haven't got my healing yet, or the boyfriend-girlfriend relationship broke up, and God didn't answer my prayer, I thought we'd go the distance, oh God, where are you? And I'm looking at everything temporary, I lose sight of what God has done. And here's their problem. They developed spiritual amnesia. They forgot about this God who came down into Egypt and he struck down Pharaoh with plagues and then the death angel came on the night of the Passover and because of the shed blood on their doorpost, led him out with a mighty hand, opened up the Red Sea, showed him his miraculous power. They forgot about all the good things that God did and when that happened, they began to speak out a confession that was a lie, but listen, what you confess will end up being the track that you run on in the future. I don't know about you, but I'm talking about the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God. Our church is going to grow and thrive. Your marriage is going to succeed. God's pouring his spirit out in California. We're going to be the head and not the tail. We're going to be above and not beneath. God's coming back for a glorious church. I get to be a part of it. Come on. It's going to get better. And I'm not just Pollyanna hype, like, ooh, everything's wonderful. You know, you meet some of these glib, positive confession Christians. They're like, they're, they're hacking, coughing. They got 104 temperature. They're like, I'm not sick. And Jesus, dude, you're dying. Get, get away from me, you know? <laughs> that, that's not what we're talking about. We are faith-filled pragmatists, but we have a confession that aligns with the word of God, and when you do that, you set a track to walk away from temptation because life and death. In fact, let's read out Proverbs 18, 21, and the band can come up. Read this out. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So the third way that you escape is this. You escape from a deadly confession through a vocabulary of gratitude. A voca and it's not a feeling. I think Pastor Joseph was exhorting that here in Vacaville earlier that we say, I got the joy of the Lord, and we dance before him, we shout, because it's a biblical command. And you're going to see this verbiage throughout Scripture. Look at this in, in Psalm 34, last verse I'll read. David said, I will. Everybody just say, I will. I will, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. Well, just when I feel good and the bills are paid and everything's great? No. I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I will make my boast in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the great works of the Lord and let us exalt his name together. Now, before we leave in just a few minutes, we're gonna do a, a spiritual exercise together and I'm gonna ask you and invite you to be a part of it and to do it wholeheartedly. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna remember the faithfulness of the Lord. I'm gonna ask you to think about what he's done, and then as the band plays, we're gonna sing one more song together. I want you to thank the Lord for what he's brought you out of. 
Thank him for what he's done in your life. All the parents, thank him for those beautiful kids. Thank him that you have a house or a job. There's so many things to thank him for. And as you do that, listen, listen, here's a key to living in his presence. Maybe, maybe you're new to the church, maybe you're new to the team here and you've never really experienced like the presence of God like we talk about. Psalm 100 verse four says this, we enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving. You ever been over to somebody's house and they, they had one of these gates with a gate code? And if you don't know the code, you're not getting in for dinner. But they were kind enough to give you the code. So you pull up and you go, do, 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 pound, and oh, I'm in. I made it. There's a gate into the presence of God. And I'm going to tell you the code. You ready? It's eight digits. T-H-A-N-K-Y-O-U. That's the code. That's, God said, you come to me grateful, with a grateful heart. And you're going to walk right into my presence. And the way we do that is we remember what God has done for us. It's not thanksgiving until it's given. It can't just be cerebral. There's got to be a moment where you speak it out. Lord, I, I thank you. I was speaking at a church, and we'll shut down here in about three minutes. We're good. You guys good? Okay, okay. Someone's like, no, I'm not. I was speaking at this church in Portland last week, and, and uh, man, this church is growing, thriving. Median age is probably 25 years old, just this young church. And, and I, I was telling them about my salvation experience and when God met me and what that felt like and what that looked like. And I, I got emotional going back 41 years and remembering God showing up in my car. Leonard Skinner on 11, going out to party on a Friday night. And the Holy Spirit whispered in my heart. Why? Because when you remember what God has done, it opens a door and gratitude begins to flow out of your life and you walk on a path toward his presence and away from temptation. You can't be grateful and thanking him and complaining and whining at the same time. It just does not work. So I want to challenge you today to apply this to your life, an attitude of gratitude that has a vocabulary. Punch the gate code and enter into his gates with thanksgiving. And what will happen is all the temptation and the snare that comes by saying the wrong things, you're going to be walking a 180 direction away from all that. And you'd be declaring, God, you did this in my past. I'm I could stand up here for a long time and talk about when he healed my body when he rescued my life, when I was reckless and guardian angels protected me, when he healed our marriage, when he, again and again, all the things that God has done, some near-death stuff with Pastor Tasha, who's speaking up in Reno today, that we just saw God's miracle hand of healing in her body several times. And when I start to reminisce about what he's done, I realize something. The same God that led me out of Egypt is leading me into an inheritance. And there's no good thing he's keeping back from me. But I got to talk about it.